Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the 20th episode of Tales of Tamriel. We have a fun show planned for you this afternoon, but first, it's time for me to introduce everyone. As always, I am Agelos, and I will be your main host for the evening. And with me, the ever vengeful, wishing she could steal all the chest in the game, Vase. How are you doing this afternoon, my dear? I am fantastic this afternoon, although it's a little hot and I'm kind of angry about that. I wish the pool was open. Man, if only my husband wasn't so lazy. Well, the pool is open and you can feel free to jump in it if you wish. It is slightly better than it was. It does not look like chocolate pudding anymore. Now it kind of looks like... Uh, no, not even green jello. Kind of maybe like watermelon kiwi jello, where it's kind of got that little cloudy green to it. But it, it's not as bad. Not as bad. And I mean, there's all those little water bugs for protein. So there you go. It, it's not terrible. That's so gross. Yes. Well, that is what I have been doing for, well, pretty much all week. So my gameplay, unfortunately, has suffered. But we have quite a bit still to talk about. All right. Now. Before we get into the news, well, this is a special episode for us because we get to give away a copy of the Imperial Edition to one lucky follower of our podcast, donated by our generous listener and fellow guildly, Ark. We have uh, decided to wait till the uh, Guild Spotlight to give it away. Yeah, I'm going to be that cruel and make people listen to near the end of the episode to find out who the winner is. So, keep listening. <gasps> Also, I want to thank Eric for his generous donation to the show. We appreciate it very much. We are a completely fan-run podcast, and as of yet, haven't had to run any advertisements on our show due to generous funding from our listeners. So, well, that's right. We are the PBS of podcasts, so we should probably have like a yearly like donation drive you ever turn on pbs and you're like i'm gonna watch whatever show it is on pbs i want to watch i noticed this mostly when i was a child but you turn it on it's like okay i want to watch this and it's welcome to our yearly fundraiser drive and for like a week it's nothing but them trying to raise funds that's us that's what we're gonna do just kidding everyone but uh we do thank you eric for your donation we'll make sure to put it to some good use probably new server space i'm I need to upgrade my server space. Okay. Finally, before we get started, I did want to send our prayers to a listener of the show, Rico24. Um, he sent me a mail-in game, and I don't want to get into too much detail because I know... Well, I don't know how much you'd like me to say, uh, but sadly, uh, poor Rico experienced a fairly serious injury at his place of employment and has been unable to work. And I know this can be very rough time for him and we just wanted to let him know that our thoughts and prayers go out to him and we wish you a swift and complete recovery as i'm sure the rest of our listeners do as well we hope you get better soon and come back to us very quickly okay time for the news first off in game news if you've been living under a rock the guys at Zenimax have been doing an amazing job pushing out some more patches and on the PTS, which, as we discussed last week, is now public, so anyone can log into it, they have pushed out patch 1.2.0. This is their second major content patch. And there's uh, some pretty interesting stuff that they've, uh, that they've added. First off, we're going to go through kind of the overview of what this patch contains. Veteran Crypt of Hearts is open. The Lich Netherith. Yeah, Netheri... It's like Netherian If. That's an awesome name. Has returned to inflict endless agony. Nariana. Thank you. Narian. Is it? Say it again. Say it again. Nariana. Thank you. Has returned to inflict endless agony on the spirits he trapped in the original Crypt of Hearts. Fight mysterious Daedra and ultimately the Lich himself to free these souls in an entirely new content experience. Veteran Crypt of Hearts continues the story begun in the original dungeon. The veteran dungeons tended to be a challenge for groups of veteran rank 12. Ow. Is this the dungeon with all the spiders? Because if it is, we are never going there. 
No, I think that's Spindle Clutch. That what you're thinking of. This is the uh, this is the one we ran with Guildies, and it's full of bookshelves, and we kept one to stop and read the books. And also, I think it's also the one where you were running and then fell through the floor. Yeah, that dungeon. That was amazing. I turned a corner and I'm just like, oh, you know, I'm gonna go over there and get some whatever treasure might be there, and then just bam, I died. But it was it was made even better because the other two guildies we ran with fell right in the hole with me. I think you were the only one who stayed alive, laughing at our dead bodies at the bottom of the stitch. This is correct. So that is the one. It it's also the one if you remember, it's the one where we had to go th through it, and I think it's the one where we free all the spirits. Remember the. Uh, the vengeful husband of the school, I think that's what it is, where he's like burning all the people that his wife talked to or whatever the case may be. I I, I could be wrong. I thought that was it, but I'm I'm still thinking that's the one. I could be wrong. Uh listeners, correct me if I'm wrong. I might be thinking of the wrong dungeon. But in any case, we're getting it in a veteran mode dungeon as well. So that's gonna be kind of cool. Next up for their feature patch is the field of view slider. So that's going to allow us to switch our field of view from 70 degrees up to 130. It's kind of nice. It, okay. It's math. So don't, don't be scared. Yeah. She's cringing over there. It doesn't really affect me because I feel that the first person view works well the way it is. Like when I'm in, when I'm in first person, I, I feel like, you know, that's, where my eyes would be looking is if I'm holding a weapon. It, it makes sense to me. But, hey, if that doesn't work for everybody, then then this is kind of an awesome patch. I like how they're tweaking the system for us. Right. It, it, it's definitely neat. Again, this is all perspective of a person. It's kind of like uh, getting into a car and having to adjust the seat. For each person, it's a little different. I mean, yeah. For you, you adjust it all the way up. Like, you're straight up. You're all the way up against the steering wheel. Yeah, you are. And then I get in, and I'm all crunched in, and I'm like, nah, 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 this has got to change. That's that's what it is. It's not even like I'm a short person, either. I'm 5'8", but I just really like to be touching the steering wheel. I am 5'8". Gosh. Okay. Well, we'll uh, we'll skip off of this and her delusions of grandeur and move on to the next section. Totally being crazy. able to pick up armor and weapons. Um, they're finally able to interact with all those weapon racks and stuff like that that we've seen. There are some key points here. Um, the items are always going to be low quality, so they're kind of junk. They sell for nothing, but you can upgrade them through crafting uh, the items can be deconstructed, but they yield very low inspiration and rarely yield usable resources. What do you think about that? I'm excited for it. I'm curious to see what kind of weapons and armor they're going to place in the world for us. And even if they are bad, it, it might still be fun to just, to just use them. Just to see, oh look, I found this shiv hiding in this corner. Let's just go attack and undead with it because it just it seems fun, it really does. I think El classic Elder Scrolls players are gonna appreciate it more than the MMO players. Most MMO players will go, "Well, this is worthless," and I mean, given the way that they play, it is. But I think it'll be nice to make the world feel very alive, and it will bring back that Elder Scrolls feel, being able to loot everything. But to be honest, let's let's face it here for uh, ladies and gentlemen who are listening. Even when you're playing Skyrim, Oblivion, Mar, any of those games, whenever you looted an armor rack, most of the time it was junk anyway. You just vendor trashed it. Albeit you did get a little bit of gold, but you still it was vendor trash because you never picked it up. And went, oh, this is like armor with this super enchant. No, you normally went and got it. Oh, great, more iron armor that weighs 30 pounds and sells for 10 gold i i don't want it that's pretty much what it was okay um next up improved interior lighting and you know what i know this is an audio podcast but uh you guys really should go to the forums are either tiso elite and check out the posts they have written up on here because they have photos of the way they're doing the lighting 
through like the stain it's gorgeous because in one of these pictures here they're in one of the chapels of the divines it looks like and the light coming through the stained glass is actually projecting onto the ground and reflecting the images that are in the stained glass uh the next photo is it's normal normal glass looks kind of frosty and you can see the it looks like real light it is absolutely gorgeous oh my goodness i am i think most excited about this i i don't know why probably because it just looks really pretty but the little things like this mean so much and when adding it to an already beautiful game it's just it just makes it look so much better I cannot wait to see how so many different things, how so, how so much different things look on the inside when this is done. I'm kind of curious because this really will make the insides look, feel even more real. I'm curious if the light will move based on the time of day outside. I don't know if they would have thought that far ahead and made that change, but it would be really, really, really cool if that if that happened so i don't know um anything else on the lighting for, okay all right next up is solo versus group call outs uh to reduce confusion when separated from your friends while entering solo instances all doors and loading screens will now tell you what type of instance you're about to enter for example the door to spindle clutch will now display a spindle clutch group instance i think that's great it doesn't really do much i mean if you if you know what the the icons look like then you know what it is but i I still think that's kind of a helpful tip for someone who runs up and goes oh what is this and sees oh it's a group dungeon or it's a public dungeon or it's a solo instance this is actually a good idea especially for people like us because there are a bunch of times where we're playing together and we zone into something and we go, oh, wait a minute, I-, I can't see you. Where are you? And then one of us goes, oh, I think we have to be alone when we do this. Or we spend five minutes like we did the very first time trying to zone to each other and it wasn't working. So I, I-, I like this. I really do. It's definitely helpful. Um, and there's a whole bunch of fixes and improvements. We're not going to go over any of that kind of stuff, but there are, there are a lot of bug fixes and different kind of, of improvements to the game. If you haven't, you can go check out the patch notes on the official forums or on TSO Elite. They've done a nice uh, write-up of it. This is also on the PTS, guys. So if you want to be part and help make this good, get out there. You have no... Um, no excuses anymore to go, oh, Zenimax released this buggy, this buggy patch because you now have the opportunity. We're not just relying on the people on the private test server. You can get on there and you can help them test. So if you haven't get on the PTS, play around with this stuff, submit bug reports, help make this a better game. Do you have anything else you want to say on this? Okay, Uh, next up in gaming news, looks like they released a video for the veteran Crypt of Hearts. Um, They say, now that Kraglorn is out, we're turning our eyes towards Update 2, which will feature a veteran version of Crypt of Hearts, which we talked about in the patch uh, 1.2.0. Like our other veteran dungeons, it continues the story and cranks up the challenge with deadly new enemies and bosses. Crypt of Hearts has some of our toughest fights yet. Sorry for the long pause there, but uh, we'll see about that, Zenimax. And we'll wait to see you and your group go up against them. To get a taste for what you're in for, check out the new video. More information about Update 2 coming soon. Check back and make sure you follow us on your favorite social media site. Now, I watched this video. It's six minutes. It's... um, they go through, they play. It looks pretty neat. It does. But uh, as for challenge, I'm still waiting to see Zenimax release something that's worthwhile of challenge. I, I I, mean, I might be a little 
cynical at this point. You can tell me if I am, but I'm still angry about Trials, how people got it down to nine minutes already after a month of it being released when ZeniMax was touting that, oh, it's going to be really difficult. Even good players are going to take like 45 minutes to beat it. And within like a day, people were beating it and getting it down to like 10 minutes. There's a flaw in their design if that's what they're doing. So uh, when they say most difficult encounters, that's why I say we'll wait and we'll see because... So far, you haven't been able to produce anything that's been super difficult for the player base, or so it seems. Other than veteran rate content, which apparently is super difficult, and everyone doesn't hates that. So, alright, so the hard stuff that people really want, dungeons, raids, are easy, but you kill us with veteran rate content. That, that seems kind of funky. So, that's it. That's the video. Uh, there's not really much to say about it. So do you have anything you want to say? Just that I never want to do this dungeon because that spider lady just looks absolutely terrifying. It's a spider, Daedra. They're cuddly. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Cuddly. I would name her Fluffy and she could, you know, sleep in bed with me. No, terrifying. I would name her Franklin and then we could move on. Okay, moving on to the next section. Gaming heads. I don't know if you've heard about these guys, but they've released some pretty cool stuff over the over the course of a couple months because they've done this a few times. I think they did this with the uh, Adra and Daedra statues, and now they're releasing a new series known as the Heroes of Tamriel statues. And they have released... It looks like they're doing the Breton from the C uh, cin cinematics. So, it looks pretty sweet they have a normal and an exclusive version um oh my there's actually not going to be a lot of them because apparently there's only going to be 500 exclusive editions and a thousand standard editions of these things that there's not a lot of them but man the detail in these are great now if you look the difference between the normal and the standard normal is it's the Breton rogue that we saw from all the trailers. He looks awesome in his amazing roguey goodness. And the exclusive edition, I think they said it has an exchangeable head. I think that's what it said. So that way you could go between the human and then the undead appearance. Yeah, it includes an alternate face. So I don't, I don't know whether or not it includes both or just the alternate. But it shows the undead version. So these are really detailed. I want them both. I, I really do. They, in, in, when watching, in watching the cinematic, he was always my favorite in that video. Because <laughs> he's the rogue type, and that's, that's the, the type that I like the most. And I just, you know, I really liked him. And I was sad when he went all, you know, gnarly and undead. But seriously, if, if you take a look at these, you're probably going to want them. Because I know I do. Well, any given the amount of detail in this, if you're in, if you're a collector, you you can go out and get them. But be warned, they do have a hefty price tag on them. They have a the retail price for each of these statues. I think it's for each uh, is three hundred dollars. Yeah, it's up there, and they you'll they'll charge you a hundred dollar deposit to reserve the copy, and then you'll get the two hundred dollars after they ship, uh, plus shipping and handling when it becomes available in q4 of this year but if you're interested in these statues and you have a little bit of disposable income be prepared for a hefty price tag they are according to the, the bethesda store 300 dollars now i haven't seen a difference like it, it's not showing me here at least i'm not seeing it where there's a difference between the exclusive edition and the normal edition maybe i'm just not looking in the right spot but, uh, yeah, so they might both be $300 and you get the pick. I, I don't know. It doesn't really say. But in any case, I can only imagine that $300 would be for the base and then um, the exclusive edition would probably be more, if anything. So don't expect it to be less. So if you're interested and have 300 bucks laying around, you can get this Breton statue. And it does look gorgeous. It really does. Anything else about the Breton statue other than the fact that you wish you had $300 to buy it? 
Are you kidding? I wish I had six hundred dollars to buy them both. Indeed. Wow. We can just stack them up next to all of our other, all of our other stuff that we have up there. Because now we have the two Imperial edition uh, collector, or the collector Imperial physical editions, two statues of Molag Ball. We have the, the, uh, um, no, the lore master books for the Elder Scrolls. And then we get this guy. We just have an Elder Scrolls wall at that point. I'm totally okay with that. I think it's a great idea. We should. We really should. Actually, what I really should do is get my blacksmithing stuff together and learn how to make a Dawnbreaker and have that up on the wall, too, because that's, like, that's what I want. <laughs> anyway, I'm not that creative, so no one no one asks me for copies of that because I won't be able to do it. Next bit of news, they released another Loremaster archive, this time an accounting of werewolves. So they, it's kind of neat. They're giving us a lot of these different lore stuff, especially on monsters. That's what the theme I've seen has been. It was werewolves, undead, and stuff of that nature. Now, we're not going to go through this entire article because, again, it's a lot of different books, and we often read many of these books, so we're not going to rehash it. But I did want to do the uh, Q&A kind of thing they had here. So uh, I'm going to read the questions, and then you can do the answers. Is that cool? All right. So now this is Sage Savari answers your questions. Much is known about how uh, lycanthropy and vampirism spread. Lycanthropy? Thank you. Lycanthropy. <sighs> Maybe I should just have my wife read all of it. Okay. No, too late. Vampirism spread. But the tales surrounding Molig Ball's creation of the first vampires are as gruesome and horrid as the god of schemes himself. Yet my scales run... Oh, it's an Argonian. All right, we can skip this question because it's from Argonians. We're just going to skip it. That's definitely not allowed. You better read it now. <laughs> my scales run dry with aggravation for, not, for never having found any legends surrounding the original creation of werewolves. So I ask you, do you have arcane lore or ancient legend to divulge on the matter of Hercene's creation of the first werewolves? Sfari says, My researches into the subject continue, but to date I have discovered no definitive account or the, of the origin of werewolves, though no one doubts that Lord Hercene was involved, if not instrumental. This lacuna is not really surprising. As the curse, or some say gift, of lycanthropy has been known in Tamriel since the early Merithic era. No written accounts date from that time, as it was before Isramor brought writing to humankind. But I hold out hope of finding a later recording of an oral tradition. You know, it is kind of funny. They don't really talk about werewolves greatly in any of the games. Um, I think the closest we've seen was the quest, uh, the Companions Guild quest, Skyrim, that kind of goes into it a little bit that I remember. Uh, but they were, they said they were cursed by a coven of witches. So whether or not the witches have the ability to do an arcane curse or whether or not they implored her, her, her scene in this, we don't really know. It's kind of strange. Okay, next question in the group. And my wife's laughing because this book. In the book, Noxophilic... Sangorvinia. Sanguivoria. Yes, that. It was stated that one of the more wild theories is that it is a result of some sort of Daedric backroom deal between Hercene and Molek Ball that has given sufferers of whatever that vamp, I guess that's the uh, vamp, or, uh, disease name, a werewolf-like love of moonlight. This is very interesting. Could you expand upon the origin of this theory? Sfari says, despite his name, Sinus Scholasticus, author of the book in question, is regarded by most serious scholars as as a self-aggrandizing, ooh, actually that's one word, I don't know, aggrandizing sensationalist. That said, 
The work is not entirely without merit, as most of it is scribed from Dr. Zorofim's comprehensive index of cursed afflictions, especially his chapter on infectious veins. However, the idea of an infernal bargain between Hersene and Molek Ball first appeared in a work of fiction, The Notorious 17 Tastes of Infamy, by the Porphyry Caratid, and must therefore be regarded as irresponsible speculation. It's one thing I really like about the Elder Scrolls is everyone contradicts each other. Like even they said, like, nah, this this guy's a loon. He doesn't know what he's talking about. So it it's kind of weird how they're they they put lore in. I don't know whether or not the developers put lore in like this intentionally to make the game feel real and then um change the lore as new games come out and then retcon it instead of doing a retcon like other games do where they're like, yeah, no, that never really happened. They just kind of add new lore going. Yeah. That guy was a fruitcake. You know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I don't know if it's the developers trying to make the world feel real or whether or not it's, they just found a creative way to retcon the changes they've done in previous games with new stuff they're doing in the new ones. Still, very interesting. Um, all right, and the final question is: What is the difference between San or is it Sanus Lupinus and Canus Hysteria? Canus Hysteria was mentioned in the Emperor's Guide from the ESO Collector's Edition. Uh, the Glen Moral witches hold the secrets of. I have no idea what that word is. Can you read that one for me? Porphyric hemophilia. Uh, and Canis Hysteria in their jealous grasp. If they were referring to C. Hysteria as a species, then why would they pair that next to the vampire disease? Wouldn't Canis Hysteria also be a disease too? Spari says, the terms Canis Lupinus and Canis Hysteria can be used interchangeably, though the former is more common, at least here in Skyrim. You know, they actually changed the name of, uh, I don't know about the werewolf as much, but the vampire disease has changed in almost every game you play. The name of the disease that gives you vampirism changes because uh, the one you just said, the prophoric uh, hemophilia, which hemophilia is blood, that, that much I know, um, that was, I think, what it was called in Morrowind, but it was called something else completely in Skyrim. It was, uh, I forget what they called it afterwards. But there were different names, like the names of the diseases change from game to game that cause the different transformations, and I think that's kind of neat. Okay, well that ends our Lore Masters archive, and the final bit of news that we have on the dock today, and probably my favorite bit of news, is Dan Bull has finished the last two of the Alliance wraps. He's, uh, if you've heard the last one, which was Let the Dagger Fall for, of course, the Dagger Fall, he's now done one for the Ebonheart Pact, as well as the Aldemari Dominion. And I do encourage everyone to go give it a listen. They're on the official Elder Scrolls Online page. So, we both listened to these, and honestly, out of, what do you think, if you wanted to rate them one through three, which was your least favorite, second, and favorite? Oh, boy. Uh, okay. My least favorite is the Aldmari Dominion one. I, you know, I just, it just is. I, it's probably because I'm biased, you know, them dirty elves can't help it. My second choice is the Daggerfall Covenant one. I think it holds some nostalgia for me because it was the first one that I heard and it was just, it was just really good. But, of course, the best one, in my opinion, is the Ebonheart Pact one. And I am trying to learn all the words to this rap because it's just so amazing. Yeah, in fact, actually, she's going to sing the rap for us in its entirety right now. Go ahead and take it away, Fates. Wow, way to put me on the spot. Yeah, I definitely don't know it that well yet. <laughs> there is no way. I just wanted to kind of give you that fear in your eyes. But uh, definitely, I you echoed my sentiments exactly. I love the Ebonheart Pack one. I was 
not really impressed with the Aldmari Dominion. I didn't like the way they switched the uh, the verses from the course. They're, they were too contrasting. I really didn't care for it. But then again, I don't really care for the elves. I mean, he worked with what he got, and they don't give him a lot. So, sorry, Aldmari Dominion, but you guys suck. Daggerfall, you're you're better. You're you're okay. And of course, Evan Hart Pact is the best. Right on. Blood for the Pact. So if you haven't, go give them a listen. They are definitely entertaining, and I know both of us we we like them. Ever since these came out, I think we've listened to them. Um, I, I would say about thirty times. Just the Evan Hart Pact one. If we'll be sitting here playing ESO, and he'll just start playing the rap, and then we'll both be singing horribly. They're, they're very enjoyable. Yes, indeed. Okay, well, that's going to end our game news for the week. We haven't had a lot, but we're going to move into our discussion topic, which we are going to discuss another topic in the news, and that is the road ahead, June 4th. Um, so if you're not familiar with the road aheads, I don't know if you're just joining us or whether or not you've been following the game a lot, Every so often, um, Paul Sage and, and Matt Firewar, I think this is Paul Sage doing, or it might be Matt. I think it's Matt. Yeah, I think so. He doesn't have his name written on this like he normally does. But anyway, they do a kind of state of the game, like what they're doing and what to look forward to, like what they're actively working on, which I really, really like. They're getting fairly good with their transparency. Could they get better? Absolutely. There's quite a few... Um, I think the was it the Wildstar developers are very active all over the place, and um, while I don't support Wildstar, their developers are definitely very transparent and do talk to their fans. Same with the EverQuest Next guys; they're very much. But then again, EverQuest Next is a whole other thing that I really think the developers are just having the fans build the game for them so they can take credit and don't have to hire people. But that's my own conspiracy theory for that. Maybe that's why they're transparent. But this Road Ahead article is definitely very cool because they do go ahead and kind of plan out what they're working on and kind of give us an idea. Now, first off is, um, why don't you go ahead and read the class ability status for us? We take extra time with class and ability balance issues and bugs, and we have to be very careful not to do too much too quickly or balance can swing wildly. All your feedback is taken seriously, and we'll continue to work on character build and balance issues on an ongoing basis. Want me to continue? Okay. Here are some of the changes that we're working on as part of regular maintenance patches. The Dragon Knight is still a bit stronger than intended, and we'll be making some small changes over time to the class. Our intent, no matter what you read on the internet, is not to nerf DKs into oblivion, so to speak, but to continue tweaking them until they are in line with the survivability of the other classes. Much to the, uh, I guess, the sadness of every VR12 Dragon Knight vampire out there. Yeah, talk about OP. We also know that Nightblades are reporting they are underpowered. I know all about this as my main character is a Nightblade, and I've been running into some of the same issues myself. Again, just like with DK, we're not going to make wholesale changes quickly. Instead, we're going to make small incremental adjustments until NB class abilities fall in line with other class abilities. Also, I sincerely apologize for not having the Biting Jabs change documented in a patch note when Update 1 went live. That was an oversight, not a nefarious omission by design. We have clearly documented many other ability nerfs in the past. We just missed this one in the massive Update 1 patch. I think they're a little lying fools. I'm, that's it. I'm done. I'm quitting the game. Unsubbing! They're nerfing my Templar. Forget them. I'm done. Forget, screw you, Zenimax. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Jeez. Um, I forget where I was now. Oh, there we go. Ultimate spamming is a problem in PvP. We'll address it on an ongoing basis. Okay, let's talk about this a little bit. Um, because this is something that, as veteran MMO players, both of us, we are very familiar with class changes. And, yeah, the ban hammer 
and stuff along those lines and how they can be a detriment to someone's play style. Um, I have plenty of experience with the nerf hammer. So I know it's something that it can just it can just destroy your entire character. I played a priest in WoW for years, and then they just totally botched it, and I will never play it again. Actually, I hear they're pretty good now, at least in Shadow Priest or like top best. But anyway, you never did DPS anyway. You couldn't DPS even if they were number one. Still going on to this. Um, I, you know what? They seem to be taking their time with the class changes because here's the thing. A lot of other weapon skills and stuff, almost everything except for those three skill lines, everyone can get. So anyone could be a vampire, VR12, whatever they wanted to be. But there's just the the class spells are very unique to those to those classes, and they seem to be taking a very light step with changes. Now, as for the Dragon Knight, I don't even care. Even other Dragon Knights will say they're OP. I mean, they they clearly are. No one can deny that they're not OP compared to every other class in the game. Hands down, if you're if you say they're not, you're lying to yourself, and you should go jump off a cliff. Yes, I said it. I did, because the world would be better without you. Um, Nightblades definitely needed help. Definitely, definitely need a little bit of help. The biggest thing I remember hearing is the ability delay. Like They were getting extreme ability delay even before, so it was really affecting a lot of their skills and stuff like that. So I'd like to see them changes. Um, biting jabs is just unforgivable. They have to change that back. Now here's something I want to ask you about is ultimate spamming is a problem in PvP. How do you think they could change this that it wouldn't cause the same problem in PvE? You know what I mean? Because ultimates are, they really are. They're very powerful abilities. Um, um, they're very powerful abilities that do a lot of damage or healing or are like uh, defensive mitigation. And if they nerf them in PVP, how do you think it'll affect the PVE game? I, I haven't encountered a place where I've had to spam in PVE. So even if they change it so that you can't spam ultimates in PVP and it indirectly affects PVE, I, I don't think it'll have any real adverse reactions because I, I never spam mine. Well, this is this would affect you in PvE because the only way they can prevent ultimate spamming, which is what they're saying is ultimates being gained so fast in PvP that what are they going to do? They're going to increase the amount of ultimate you need or reduce the amount of ultimate you gain. That's going to carry over to PvE. So whereas before you would be able to do it, let's just say every fourth mo little mob you killed, your bar would be full and you could use an ultimate. Now it's going to be further along. Again, that, that wouldn't really affect me. I use the Atronach, and I really only ever use it when I'm in a tight spot, which to me is, is how an ultimate should be. It should be your, oh crap, button. And that's how I use it. So even if they make it longer, I'm still using it only when I absolutely need it. So if they were to increase it a little bit and then I would have to judge, all right, what boss am I going to use it on? That, that would be totally okay with me because then I would have to think more and, and judge when it would be the most effective. Okay, I can respect that. I, I just know that there's, you know, like... In other games, anytime they nerfed an ability for PvP, it affected PvE in a bad way. Because one of the more powerful ultimates in the game is, much to my surprise, that Soul Assault or whatever it is from the World Ability Tree. Uh, yeah, that ultimate apparently is insanely powerful and it goes up very quickly and it channels a lot of damage. So for like trials and stuff, it builds up fast. You do a huge amount of damage, you build it up again. To extend that out, that ultimately lowers your effective DPS for that trial. So, I mean, that's that could be kind of rough. That's a great idea. Because they're saying that the trials should be difficult anyway. So if you're able to spam, it shouldn't be a spammable ability. 
it should be something that you think about using. It should take a while to build up. I, I shouldn't be able to use my Atronach every fourth mob. It just doesn't just doesn't seem plausible. Well, certain. Well, each, as you know, most ultimates have different costs to them. So Atronach wouldn't be. That would be a a, a higher cost one. But even um, I'm trying to think of a very low my Crescent Swipe, which really is just a really powerful AOE. But it's not even that super powerful. Like even with doing that, it won't kill a group of mobs my level, but it might take them down to half health. Um, it's just a lot of, but that's meant to be built up very quick and used. That would lower DPS. Now the whole making trials harder. I don't think changing ultimate will really affect that. But uh, it's gonna be kind of interesting to see how they do this, because I'm just not sure how they would be able to lower the ultimate gain in PvP without affecting PvE. That's the problem I'm seeing. Unless unless they remove the or lower the amount of ultimate you gain from attacking players. I don't know if they could separate that, but generally just across the board cutting the rate at which you gain ultimate could hurt the PvE game more than the PvP game because most often you're running with a huge group anyway and someone should have an ultimate up. But, I don't know. Do you have anything else to say on that before we move on? Nope. Okay. Uh, next up, they are moving the European mega server. Or they are working hard to migrate it to its final home in the European data center. Uh, the move should be made sometime during the summer. And they'll let us know when they have more info to share. Um, I guess that's good. I mean, it'll it'll lower the lower the ping responses for the European players since they don't have to connect to a server all the way over here. I know I experienced... Now, this was earlier, but uh, and not with this game, but uh, Final Fantasy XI, the servers were all hosted in Japan. My, my, uh, my ping was really high connecting from the States here. Like, really high. And it did cause for some laggier gameplay uh, than what I would have anticipated. Now, again... Uh, Square Enix has never been very good with their net code, so I'm not really saying they're the best in the world. But the further you are away, of course, from the data center, the more the longer your ping responses are. So I don't know if the European players have been having a lot of issue. I'm sure some of them have, and this should definitely help. Yeah, anything to say on that? I don't play in Europe, and I don't understand all that techie stuff, so nope. <laughs> all right. Um, PvP campaigns. We are now two-thirds of the way through the 90-day duration PvP. I think it's 180-day, but that's beside the point. Campaigns we launched with. So we're starting to think about additions and changes to the campaign system. As shown by the new shorter-length campaign we launched in Update 1. We'll post some additional information and thoughts on the forums to bounce ideas off the community. So stay tuned for that. Some of our ideas include more short-term campaigns or alternate rule sets. We will want to shake things up a bit, but we're going to make sure everyone knows what we're doing before we change anything. So, PvP campaigns. Originally, they were 180 days, like all of them. It was meant to be a fairly... Well, he said 90 days. I'm thinking it's 180, but in your case, three, six months. It was meant to be a very long-standing game, because I think even when the game launched, one of the things they said was... They wanted to be different from Guild Wars 2 with a two-week campaign because everything felt so temporary. You know what I mean? What What do you think about this, the fact that now they've launched a two-week campaign? I think it's... For me, I think it's a good idea. For someone who doesn't PvP very often, something that feels temporary is much better for me than those really long campaigns. Because if I'm never in PvP, I'm not affecting anything. I'm not helping anybody. I'm not changing anything. So with the shorter campaigns, I feel like I'm doing more to contribute since it's it's a short time. So I, I do. I, I like that. Not everyone likes to PvP all the time. But for people like me who want to do it sometimes, it's a good idea. You know, actually, I think it's generally a fairly good idea. I think one of the bigger complaints with Guild Wars 2 was the lack of permanence. Every two weeks, all the keeps reset. Now, apparently the keeps aren't resetting at the end of a campaign. Like, if you've owned it, it you're keeping it. 
you know, so the map doesn't automatically reset at the end of every campaign cycle. Um, or so they've said. Now, this may change, I'm not really sure. Um, I guess... My, my thing is, even with the people who PvP all the time, when it's, when it's really, really far into the game, like for maybe the first month people are really active, but it really does seem like people are dropping off. Uh, case in point on Hope's Fire, I noticed that there hasn't been a lot of activity on the Hope's Fire. I don't know if people are moving off of it or what the case may be, but the Aldmari Dominion is four times higher than, than the Evanheart Pack. And we are twice as high as the Daggerfall Covenant in points. The real kicker is the Aldmari Dominion Emperor has been Emperor for 27 days. So no one has even tried to take the Emperorship. Like, they haven't lost all six keeps in 27 days in the inner ring. So whether or not the other two factions have just kind of given up playing or moved on to other factions, I'm not really sure. But it really does seem that the longer, the longer game styles are not doing as well, which I really think it's the type of culture we live in, the get in, get out kind of culture that World of Warcraft, uh, Guild Wars 2, Wildstar, um, some of the MOBA games that, ha that the current gaming generation is in is pointed. They want to get in, get out, get the reward and leave. In Dark Age of Camelot, for instance, there were no campaigns. It was just an open world PvP where you took keeps, and it stayed that way for years, and people still did it every day, every week. But the gaming populace has changed. The people who played that game, um, I, will, I will say this, I was young when I started playing it, 16 or almost 10 years ago. Um, I was younger at that point in time, and a lot of the people who were playing were my age or older. So now most of the people who are playing that those games were are in their late 30s, early 40s by now. And the younger generation of, of kids who were brought up on League of Legends, my, all these quick Call of Duty, the get in, get out kind of gamers are now coming into their prime and hopping into the MMO space due to World of Warcraft opening up MMOs to the great populace that a lot of these while I enjoy them because I feel like, you know, I'm not terribly old, 27, but I, I w I'm kind of in that weird mixture between the younger generation and then the older one that was playing MMOs before. Like, it was an odd thing. For, when people ask how old I was, I'm like, oh, I'm seven. People are like, how are you even playing this game? You know, like, it was odd. I was odd to be young. But nowadays, you log in, you have you know, 8, 9, 10, 14, you know, 15-year-olds playing this game, all these different games, because it's just it's what they do now. Um, and with that, game developers are making choices. Of course, you got to keep your customers and, and play towards who you're trying to sell to. And it seems like the younger generation really just wants these quick get in, get out, get my reward, and move on. What do you What do you think about that? I would actually completely agree with you. I really would. It does feel like we're stuck in the middle. It really does, because we're, we're not really with that older crowd, but we can't really fit in with the younger crowd, because they're so different from us, but the older crowd's different from us. And the, 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 the newer generations now are extremely impatient. They're just, they're impatient, always impatient. They, they don't want to wait for anything and they they want it now and they want it all now and it, it's not how it works especially not in an MMO because I think as even as this article said it says ESO is a living evolving game most MMOs are so you have to wait it's going to take time you need to work up to it it's just how it is so the longer campaigns should make more sense, but people just don't like them. And I, I think it's just the, the problem, I think, is the lack of rewards and incentives. Like, I mean, yes, as you rank up, you're getting skill points, stuff like that. And the Dark Age of Camelot fans 
will remember they used to get skill points, but it used to be it took a long time to get realm ranks. And you, while you did get rewards, the longer you went, the longer it took to get essentially smaller rewards. But people kept going. Nowadays, just like the veteran rank debacle that's going on, people feel like they're not getting enough reward for the time they're putting in, even though the older games did this. Like, the longer you played, the less you could do to get reward. I mean, my goodness, that's for anything. Like, even even content locust and uh, achievement uh, achievement junkies like myself, uh, Warcraft, I collected, like, every achievement I could. When I first started to get the achievements, they were dinging in like crazy because I had so much to do. But as I got near the end, my achievements would come in slower and slower and slower because I had to... I, I got rid of all the small, easy ones... And I only had the long-term ones still left. So it was a much longer time to get these certain things. And it just feels like it, as a whole, you can't base a game nowadays off of long-term goals. It needs to be these short get-in, get-out kind of stuff um, to make people happy. And you have to kind of hide the long-term goals in and out. Kind of like... um, you know, do the long-term goals of things that they'll always do. You sort of, you know, capture uh, a thousand keeps. Well, you do that over a natural gameplay cycle. You have to kind of hide in the long-term stuff rather than make it so readily apparent. Okay, so I, I don't know what they're going to do with alternate rule sets. I have heard some pretty interesting stuff, which I hope they do, because I had heard things such as they want to do a non-VR ranked and a VR ranked only campaigns. So that way they separate out the VRs from the leveling. Unfortunately, now we're VRs and we're on the low end. But um, I think that would that alone would be awesome to have a non-VR rank. I would probably level up one of my characters just to play in it because everyone would be still leveling. So PvP campaigns, new stuff is going to be coming out. Should be pretty exciting. I hope they... Uh, I really hope they nail some stuff together and and, uh, bring the PvP scene back because it seems kind of empty at the moment, at least for the long campaigns, maybe the shorter ones more active. Um, They're telling us there were some connection issues logging into the game over the past few weeks. Uh, They are working on taking care of that. If you're still having problems with, like, getting an Air 301, you can contact customer support. I haven't gotten any 301s. Have you? No? Yeah. Definitely not. My my game runs perfectly. Yeah, me too. I mean, not not saying against the other people. I haven't had a lot of issues with the game. Even people saying, "Oh, this is a problem. This is a problem." There's been very few times where we've actually even run into bugs in the game. There might have been a few quest bugs, but generally, I think the worst bug I had is when I logged in, you know, got kicked out of the game in Shadowfen, and then it kept saying my data was corrupt. And I had to do a, a reinstall, not a reinstall, but a, a a check disk essentially of the game where it verified all my files. But that was the worst bug I think I've had. Albeit, until that thing checked, I was very scared going, oh my goodness, my character's destroyed. <laughs> that was a very scary time for me. Those 30, 40 minutes of waiting for it. Um, as stated earlier... The PTS is now a public test server. You can get to it by uh, going into your system settings. And there's actually an option when you open up the launcher to view the PTS. Now, just as a note, if you download this, you are re-downloading the entire game again. So be prepared. It's a lot of gigs of data. But the public test server is available. Now, we talked about it in the patch 1.2 notes, but... Update 2 is now on the PTS for everyone to test. I do recommend everyone go in there. Okay, now it's the fun stuff. There are longer-term updates. This was the fun things. This is the things they're talking about for updates uh, 3 and 4, which they're already working on. So update 3 is scheduled to arrive sometime in July, and it will focus on player customization, including systems like armor dying guild insignias and tabards and will also be the start of the rework of our delves the smaller dungeons to make them much larger and give them 
more worth exploring. Um, let, let's let's just let's dig into this. Um, I know the first thing that they have on here is that they're working on uh, the layering problem in Elder Scrolls Online. If you're unsure of what that is, the layering problem is where, like, if someone's completed a quest and you haven't yet, it kind of phases you out into a different phase. That can be kind of a problem when trying to play with friends unless, like, you're like the East and I where we always play together. We've never had that problem, but we always play together. So... We've never given that opportunity uh, for that problem to arise. Other people who play by themselves and when their friend logs on go to try to play together probably have those issues quite frequently because I know I had those issues during beta, trying to go back and help you, trying to go back and help other friends. It came to the point where I'm like, if we're going to play together during beta, we just have to start a character from one and level together, which is what we did for live, which has been great, by the way. It's awesome. Okay, so they're going to work on that. Um, they'll also introduce more veteran dungeons, another area of Craglorn with an all-new trial, hopefully more difficult, and much, much more. Stay tuned for details. So, now they've been looking very closely at the veteran system, and they want to make it more exciting to get the level 50, or be a level 50. In order to take, uh, in order to take on the veteran system, we have to use an approach that addresses several key components. First off, we're going to talk about these in, in just each bullet point. Itemization. We'll add gear that's harder to acquire but more worthwhile. You're looking at gear that will make others envious when you're wearing or wielding it, both in appearance and in stat boost. To do this, we'll adjust soft caps so that they don't kick in quite as quickly. We have to be very careful about how much we adjust numbers because the greater the variance, the more people can hurt their intended builds. Itemization. Let's talk about that for a minute. Planning on releasing items that are more interesting to get. What do, what do you think they mean by that? You know, I, I can't actually be sure uh, unless they're adding more loot tables to raids the the trials but with the with the content that we have now i can't picture a viable way for new gear to to come about like how are you going to stumble upon this new gear well let's first let's go over this like the current gear is it has an armor rating based on the type of armor it is it has one enchantment generally with a certain stat and then it sometimes has a trait right and every once in a while a set bonus to do something else that's the current way gear is done I, I, i'm trying to think of how they're going to make gear that's harder to acquire because currently all gear can pretty much be upgraded from one of the crafting or being made by crafters and have certain set i know they said certain set bonuses will be rare but do you think they're going to add gear that possibly maybe starts out low, but maybe has a second enchant or something on it? What do you think? Do you mean like adding another enchanting slot through crafting? I don't even just mean through crafting. I mean, maybe it has it innately that you can't remove it. Or like you said, maybe like, cause you can normally do one enchant, but maybe this gear that you get as a drop has the ability to put two enchants so you can have a strength and stamina, or not strength and stamina, but health and stamina enchant, or, or whatever the case may be. Because currently it's one enchant, one trait, one set bonus, and then the armor rate. And I, I, I mean, honestly, it, it does make for kind of um, uninteresting gearing. Because in other games that had a wider range of stats, like your Wildstar, for instance, you'd get gear that had your primary stat, normally a health stat, like strength, stamina, but then they, they flare it up a little bit by going, well, this piece gives you extra critical strike, or this one gives you, I don't know what Wildstar has, but I know uh, Warcraft did that with, you'd get an armor piece, like this armor piece would have the same armor as this armor piece, but this one favors haste and crit versus crit and expertise, or whatever the case may be, and then if your class favored haste you'd be like oh, must have those pants or you know that piece of armor 
do you think that was something they could do? Like, because currently it's not fun gearing. Oh yeah, that's definitely something that they could do. It really is. They could, they could make it droppable where it has an enchant on it, but then there's another extra slot for you to choose another enchant. They could, I, you know, I, I don't even know. The, the possibilities, there's so many possibilities. that There really is. They could make it a crafting skill. Remember in Skyrim, it was a skill that you could enchant a piece of armor with, with two enchants? They could do it like that. Then you could customize your gear even more. But the way that they're saying it is when you're wearing it or wielding it in appearance and in stat, people are going to be envious. So then if it's something that looks really cool, are you really going to want people to be able to make that? Because getting mats isn't exactly that difficult. I have tons of mats that I can make all kinds of stuff. So it has to be done in a way where people where it's hard to acquire. Not everyone should be able to just snap their fingers and get this super, super awesome flaming tabard of righteousness. Because it needs to be something that's, just, that's amazing. Now, I'm all a fan for looks, because you know me, as you call me a little prissy guy sometimes. I, if it doesn't, looking good's half the battle. Okay? So if it doesn't look good, I don't want it. The problem with armor skins and stuff like that is, while I think armor skins are awesome because that's something you can make drop and it be unique, that no one, you, crafters can't make this style, it's a unique thing. Um, people want it. Guild Wars 2 did this with styles and stuff like that where there were styles that you would want to get. But eventually weapon skins were just that because they were they used all the same stats. and I don't think it provided the same gearing fun I mean, other than making your character look good, it it didn't didn't really affect much. Because some people are like, I don't care what my character looks like. I just want the best stats. You know, I, I really don't care. I'm not going for a special look. I, I just don't care. And in terms of itemization and wanting to get gear, looks are definitely part of it. Uh, definitely a big part of it. But a lot of the hardcore players, the hardcore PvPers, the hardcore raiders, which... I don't think are any in this game because the raids aren't that hard to do are more concerned about the stats than they are about if it looks good. So yes, I mean unique gear to look at is awesome because it does set it apart because I can't tell if you're wearing a legendary piece of crafted gear generally, you know, it's like if someone crafted it for you, it's like, Oh wow. Yeah. Stats legendary. That's awesome. But you really can't tell because they could have, they could have made it an Argonian style. It looks just like every other Argonian style, just maybe a little shinier because it's legendary. There's not really a way of telling. So unique armor pieces. So when you see a guy wearing a specific armor going, oh, that's not one of the crafted styles. Yeah, then you definitely can go, yeah, that's awesome. But my big fear with this itemization, and not that I'm against it, but it they've already set in their guidelines and this is where players will yell is they said crafted gear would always be on par with other gear. Okay. So why, like if they make it so that you, uh, an item piece drops and it has a, a enchant that you can add another one, then the only logical course to not go back on their statement is to allow enchanters and stuff to put two enchants on any piece of armor they find. In which case there we are again with the problem of, well, then what does it matter? You know? It would matter. It really would. Because if if they make it something that drops, that has this really cool skin, that's awesome. You're going to be one of the few people who has it that looks that way. And when people look at you, they'll know that you have these souped up stats and you've beaten this specific boss and you'll look great in that armor. But they can also make it for enchanters another level so they can do two enchants and they can make gear that doesn't look as good as the gear that drops, but has the same stats. So you're going to want to work... Well, people like me, because since I, I always want my character to look good, I'm not all about the stats. I'm about my character looking great. <laughs> I know that I would be going for the gear that looks better rather than the gear that looks like I, I picked it up out of the sewer. 
So even if they make it a way that you can still craft it with those stats and that double enchant, but that you can pick it up somewhere and it just looks amazing, it, it's it's still an idea that they can do. Oh my, sorry about that. I started laughing because when you said that, all I could think of was that archer girl. It is amazing! <laughs> that's That's what I saw the entire time you were saying that, just so you know. That's what you were okay, okay. Now here, here's something for you. What do you think about this? Um, what do you, what do you think of adding to this gear unique? Like it, it will take, it'll take the place of a trait. So that way, technically, you could have the best gear. But they add special traits to these weapons, or not even weapons, but it could be weapons armor that's different than normal traits the way that they could do that would be they could add more gems to the game like make a gem drop somewhere that you can't get by breaking down armor and then you could add the special trait because that's how the traits are done with the gems right so if they find interesting new interesting gems and you go oh look at this i have a trait that makes me run 10 times faster than joe schmo and my feet are on fire that would be fantastic but the gem only drops you can't get it anywhere else besides defeating this one thing to get this special gem to drop it would definitely make it interesting like even if they would remove like i said removing the the traits and adding unique ones such as a sword that has a cleave on it like by default it splits damage saying like 10 percent of the damage done by this weapon hits other targets but only from this weapon or armor that when you get hit it's a five percent chance to create a damage shield equal to so much percent those kind of traits that you can't get through crafting would but you know like you won't have your divines enchant or anything like that it would be unique that would be the only way i could see them adding special things to make gearing more interesting See, now that I thought of that idea, I'm in love with that idea. That idea. <laughs> they really should. There are so many gems in the world. They could make so many special gems with new interesting traits that would really allow you to customize your gear. They add, they add a second enchanting slot and new gems for your gear. It's, it's perfect. That's just, it's just absolutely perfect. It's, I think it's a great idea. They should do that. That's, that's the idea. Okay, well, let's move off of itemization before we do too much more, but I'm interested to see what they do to make it. Make gear that would make us want to go get it versus just having a crafter craft this stuff. Um, veteran ranks, they're looking to give us more points to spend when you hit veteran ranks. I know there's um, a problem with veteran ranks is they say you work so much longer for, like, no points. Because when you level, I don't think you get stat points i think you might get a skill point i'm not really sure uh, maybe not um but most of the only points you get are by going out and doing the quests that give you points or by uh collecting sky shards so veteran ranks you don't every time you level you get a point you get attribute points you get skill points the current way veteran ranks are set up is you don't get that like you really you're leveling for not a purpose other than a number. And it it's kind of reminds me of what game was it? Shadowbane, where they had a soft cap for level, but in theory there was no hard cap. You could continue leveling for eternity if you wanted to. Like I seen people who were I like 212 because they just sat there all day like because they were botters and they just kept killing the same monsters over and over again. Yeah, they only got like one experience, but eventually they killed 30 million monsters, got a level, and they're like 200 and something. It was crazy. Um, but, I mean, that was an art of... After the soft cap, you really didn't get anything. Being a 200 was no different from being a 50, other than the fact that your number was bigger. <laughs> that was it. So... <laughs> but don't you know that the bigger numbers win? It's just better to be a bigger number. That's math, right? That that's that is math. Yes, unless you're playing golf, then bigger numbers are not better, not better at all. Okay, so they are gonna adjust veteran ranks to try to give us more points to spend. 
Do you think that's a good idea? I do. I, I really do. It, it'll it'll make people less angry at hard, at how hard leveling in the veteran ranks is. Well, we talked about it earlier, and it still it goes back onto it. It's that I want to work less for more reward, and now people are being forced to work harder for less reward, and that's just not the type of culture we have. Now, the last bit of news here um, is the more content, we're going to continue providing more content on a regular basis, more veteran dungeons, areas like Craglorn, Trials, and etc. Uh, further, we're going to allow dungeons to level to the group leader that means you'll be able to pick or you'll be able to go back and play any dungeon that rewards appropriate or rewards are appropriate for your group leader's level. That'd be kind of interesting going back and even at level 50 and maybe doing like fungal grotto non-veteran and getting get good rewards. I don't know. Now, this is the real news we really wanted to talk about in the longer term updates because they were talking about this. One of the things they're doing is armor dying, armor dying, armor dying. Oh my goodness, armor dying. Take away these. I'm just going to let you go. I am so excited, especially since I mentioned, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes ago that I'm all about my character looking good. That that to me is just phenomenal. If I'm questing and I'm wearing pink and purple armor, I feel like I'm the queen of the world. I just want to look great. That also gives us something to collect. In Guild Wars 2, I had over 200 dies. And I was frequently changing the color of my armor because the colors were vivid and bright, vibrant, and Ag and I both did this. Depending on the season of the year, we made our dyes match the season just because it was fun. This allows you to really become your character. If your favorite color is green and yellow, your armor can be green and yellow. It's also giving you options to dye different parts of the same piece of gear, which to me, I, I can be pink, purple, and blue all over the place if I really wanted to. A and I do I wholeheartedly. And just from this little you know, sneak preview they're giving us, there is a bunch of different colors that they're messing with already. You can even see a slider. So there's more colors we can't see in this picture. And I am just ecstatic. One of the other things I mentioned to Ag when looking at this picture was that the dyeing station actually looks like it's covered in dye. There's vats of dye sitting there, there's splatters all across the table, and I like that little detail. That in order to dye your armor, it looks like you have to go to this dyeing station. So when, when they put this into the game, I'm probably going to spend hours just trying to find dye. I'm going to be completely broke because if there's a dye vendor. Now here's something that I, like, this almost looks identical to Guild Wars 2 dye system. Now, they didn't give us any hints, but do we know? Like, I, the one thing that makes me think dyes will be findable, we don't know this for sure. Maybe, maybe it, there's two ways they could do this. All dyes are available, but certain dyes cost more. That's how they did it in Dark Age of Camelot. Um, black dyes were 10 gold per vial black dye, whereas charcoal gray was 1 gold. And so if you wanted the good dyes, they were more expensive. Or do you think they're going to be going to be found? And I'm kind of leaning towards the found too, because if you look very closely at the screenshot, you see right up there at the very top where it has sort by hue, and then there's a little box that says show locked. There's a little box that says show locked, so it makes me think you have to do something, whether it's finding the dies, completing achievements that unlock special dies, whatever, however the die system is showing locked, maybe even researching dies, because we know they're not above, beyond that. Um, I think that would be kind of cool to research dies. But they have a show locked checkbox. Now, again, this is still a work in progress and may change. But I, I highly doubt they're going to go with the old Dark Age of Camelot, whereas light blue costs one gold, royal blue is ten gold. And then when you pick all your die, it tallies all your money. Go, okay, you owe 3,000 gold because of your die. Um, or whatever the case may be. 
it really does look like what it is is there is you unlock them now <clears throat> just judging by like some of the tools that i'm seeing here it looks like there's an autofill but one of the things that kind of interests me is there's a paintbrush it looks like a paintbrush i wonder if you'll be able to kind of go freeform with your die maybe draw i was looking at those buttons too because they have an eraser they have a teardrop what are they thinking about you know since we're already playing with you know speculation here and of course it's fun what are they testing it, it just it, it makes me just so curious here's one other thing i just noticed you see right below the tools there's four little spots that say saved sets it looks like you can do a color pattern because yes each piece of armor has three pieces uh two small squares and a rectangle the rectangle of course is supposed to represent the largest pattern and the other two are supposed to be accent marks looks like you can pre-save sets like a color scheme if you want to do like you could probably go freeform if you want or if you got a pattern that you really liked on your armor it looks like you could save it in one of these four save sets so that way you don't have to remember oh well i use burnished steel on the accent but then i used flame red on the main you know you can save it out there it looks like and that looks really neat i'm hoping it's not going to be a pay by die because i will never ever have any money i will be going to you probably every two days going hey hey babe i need i need five thousand gold and you'll be yelling, what do you need that for? Like to dye my armor. But you just dyed your armor. I know. It's it's a crazy addiction. I, I would be using all those saved sets. I, I really would. And there'll be all kinds of frilly, girly colors. I, I will be like the pink ranger of ESO. I really hope they try to stay away from the bright colors. I really do. I don't want to see super pink rangers running around in my ESO. There's a difference between vibrant colors and bright colors. Because the red and the gold in this picture look really, really nice. But if you look down at the purples here, none of them look like they're extremely bright. Which what would fall into what you don't want <laughs> i don't know i see a pretty bright pink there maybe it's not hot pink but i do see a pretty bright pink and i don't like it, it when this happens and if there is a pink dye just for you i'm gonna be nothing but pink and i'll be your little pink ranger i know <sighs> that's a shame but yeah so definitely the dye system is probably one of the things that i'm looking forward to most of what they've announced so far barring better raids and housing um this looks super cool and should allow us to kind of stand apart because I, I can tell you this right now and i know why almost everyone i see who's wearing heavy armor has it looking like the imperial armor because it let's be frank here it looks the best i think so anyway there's very few people who are wearing any of the other armor sets at max level it's normally always imperial because the imperial looks the best as a heavy armor Maybe that's my opinion, but apparently a lot of other players think so, too. The reason all mine looks Imperial is actually not because it looks the best. It's because I like when my sets match. And so far, I'm not high enough to create set pieces. Like, I've been going with, like, two of this one, two of this one, and three of this one. I'm not high enough in all of my crafting to create all those pieces in one specific style with the traits that I want. So I always set my armor to Imperial because then it all looks the same. Because I, I can't run around with mismatched armor. You know, war isn't about winning. It's, it's who looks the best. Right. But I guess, and I agree with you, but um, I guess the main thing is even if we are all wearing Imperial, we can dye it different colors and maintain a little bit of individuality. So... Anything else you want to say about the die system before we move on? Add lots and lots of dies so I go broke. I want to be just flaming. That's what I want. Super excited. I bet everyone can tell. 
Yeah, and I think they all can. <laughs> all right. Well, that's going to end our discussion topic for the road ahead. And I mean, it looks like they got some pretty neat stuff coming down the line. Still waiting on housing, still waiting on better raids. But uh looks like they're they're doing pretty good for I guess uh what is that? What's the proper word here? Uh Oh crud, there's a term for it. Value of life or something like that. Cost, I don't know, it's value of life. Anyway, uh, making the game just a lot more stuff to do. Sorry about that, I just couldn't think of what I wanted to say. All right, we're gonna move on to our next section, which is the Tales of Tamriel section. Now, we're gonna go on where we left off last week. And uh, first off, Let's talk about our characters and see if anything has changed. As always, ladies first. Well, Ag did make me some daggers. <laughs> and the reason I'm laughing is because I, I you know, I equipped them and everything was good. I was I was, you know, happy to get started. And the first mob that we encountered, I died. And it, it made me very sad because <laughs> Now that I'm up close, normally I do everything far away from the enemy, but now that I'm up close and I'm wearing, you know, mixed armor, I just, I take tons of damage, I have no, no uh, points in this, I, it's at only like level 6, it was, it was rough, so needless to say, within 10 minutes I unequipped my daggers and put my staff back on. I worked hard on those, I even made them artifact quality. I didn't say I would never use them again, but at the last steps in Cold Harbor, there is no way I can be using them now. I, I need to be using my high-level stuff, not, not working on my new skill. So instead, you'll wait till we're in veteran rank stuff, which is supposedly even harder than Cold Harbor. Actually, I have a plan. I'm going to go back to the Rift. And I'm going to, you know, maybe farm some mats, kill some mobs, have a good time, maybe take part in a, in a, in a dungeon uh, with the, the open, the public dungeons. There we go. So it's, I have a plan on, on how to make it work. Okay. All right. Well, is that all you changed on your character so far this week? Yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I, I tested out the daggers and I uh, lost a lot. What we need to do is, when I'm leveling my resto staff, is when you need to try to go in there as melee. That way I can be your healer, because at the time, you're meleeing in whatever concoction of armor that you currently are wearing, and I'm plucking away with a bow. We don't, Other than my Templar abilities for healing, we don't have a lot of healing. So that, that could be pretty rough. But uh, as for myself... My heavy armor hit 50 last week, and um, as such, because it hit 50, and I want to start leveling my other things, that um, I took off all my heavy armor. All of it. And I decided, well, before I hit veteran ranks, and need to start putting trait points and everything everywhere, I'm going to try leveling my other armor skills, which I always wore at least one medium and one light. Unfortunately, they didn't level as fast as my heavy armor. So what I did was I, I had my lovely wife, Thais, over here make me a full set of light armor, or as many as she could with the training uh, trait on it, as I try my best to level up that skill. I do notice in the light armor, because currently I have no points in it whatsoever, um, so I'm not really getting any of the Magicka benefits, but all I'm doing is getting hit like a ton of bricks. Thankfully, I am playing with the bow, so I'm trying to stay at range, but even so, both of us are ranged, so we're just... It's a kite fest at the moment. When, when we're both ranged, I have my staff and you have your bow, everything, everything is good, but... That first mob that I died on is when I put my daggers on and he has no points in his bow and it was just a disaster waiting to happen. It, it was quite humorous if someone had been watching that. Me trying to run in circles, you running in opposite circles. It, it, definitely, it definitely is rough. Really, really rough. Um, so I see this as a little bit of growing pains for us because we are trying out. Like I have no intention of wearing... Um, light armor even as a templar 
My main, I'm thinking I'm going to go final set is two pieces of heavy and five pieces of medium. Yeah, because I'm, I'm very melee, two-handed weapon focused. I think a lot of my stuff is going to actually be weapon skills. So as such, I'm not going to need as much magicka as I thought. I'm going to need more stamina based and more more things to increase my crit from physical because that's where most of my damage is going to come from. I haven't decided what kind of armor I'm going to wear late game. Because right now it really is just a hodgepodge of different things. Because I like having the extra defense from the heavy armor. And this is, this. wow, I'm going to, he's going to yell at me for this. This is the only game where I've ever liked heavy armor. Like It looks, it doesn't just look horrible. It looks, you know, it looks really neat. And I kind of enjoy wearing it. And the robes just don't look as nice as, as the heavy armor top and pants do. So I, even into much later levels, I'll probably still be wearing mixed and matched pieces of armor minus medium because that does absolutely nothing for me. So I'll probably be heavy armor and light armor. Well, yeah, light armor is definitely very much the healer and, and caster stuff. It, it does a lot of magicka. Um, heavy armor is the tanking type thing that allows for healing. But yeah, the medium armor is designed for the stamina user, the stamina weapons. Um, so that's why I'm mostly a melee, and I know you're mostly a caster. So that, that would make sense. Um, all right, so now we're going to move on to the next section, which we get to talk about what we've been doing. Now, I wrote down a couple different things of places that we've visited, and we're just going to go over them. Continuing from last week, we are still in Cold Harbor, playing around, chasing that awesome, awesome Cadwell around because he's just awesome. He is, like, hands down the best character in this game. He really is. Um but starting from last week, I think uh, what we did was we went back to the western half. Like when you're in the hollowed city, the thing is split into three parts. The northern half, western, and eastern half. Because uh, the southern half is where we first came in at the portal. There's really nothing there other than Cadwell's hovel. No, you don't. You're looking confused over there, Thais. What are you I, I am looking confused because if there's three parts, can you really be calling them halves? <laughs> I see. I see. That's what you're talking about. All right. Point taken. Okay. Uh, thirds. We split into thirds here. And so we decided to go into the western third of the area again because we, we had finished part of it, the lower half of it, over the last week and talked about that a little bit and then I actually started going over to the other side. But we, we, we halted as we were getting ready to go into the eastern third of Cold Harbor. But we actually decided to backtrack a little bit because I noticed that there was still a large section of the western third that we haven't experienced yet. I love you so much right now. <laughs> right. I uh, know. Love you too, babe. Okay. So we went back to the western third and started heading up north because there were certain sections that we missed along before you get to the, the chasm, um, which is currently locked off, because that's pretty much the final approach into Molag Ball's realm. Um, and one of the things we actually found right off the bat was a place called the Tower of Lies, which is kind of ironic, because we actually run into a wood elf who gives you the quest for the Tower of Lies, and, and you're like, so where are we? This is the Tower of Lies, and it's you look down this big pit, it's like, I don't know if it's just meant to be ironic or maybe there was a tower here. But yes, I do realize that it is a giant hole in the ground and not really a tower. Um, so we actually, it's funny because he's like, I, I'm just a coward. He's part of the Fighters Guild and he's just a big coward. And he's like, nope, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to jump it, you know, just jump off the edge and, and help this giant orc guy out from the Fighters Guild. But please don't tell him he's, I, I freaked out and ran off or he's going to kill me. So you jump off the edge into the water and you find this orc from the Fighters Guild. He, he's just a funny guy because he's like everyone else is slaves in this kind of like pit quarry thing. And there's all these Ogrom and uh, I think it's just Ogrom in there, right? Am I 
for the Daedra, I don't think there's anything else. Oh, maybe higher up. There, there were more than Ogrims, because uh, for the one quest we were fighting... Oh, gosh, what are they called? The, oh, yeah, yeah the, the giant eyeballs. They look like Beholders from the uh, Forgotten Realm series, or Boulder's Gate, just the big tentacle Beholders. Yeah, those guys. But it <clears throat> it's a myriad of the lesser Daedra that are guarding, because because most of the Ogrom and the Watchers and stuff, from what I understand in the hierarchy of Daedra, are kind of the low-end shock trooper brute force. There's very few of the humanoid Daedra, uh, which are the higher end of in the ranking of uh, Daedra. Um, but it's funny because when you talk to him, he's like, yeah, he's just leaning up against a rock. He's like, what are all these people doing? Like, they're all slaves. He's like, well, why are you just standing here? And he's like, no one makes this orc do anything that he doesn't want to do. Like, the Daedra are scared of this orc cause he's a big orc. Um, but what's really fascinating is there is another Daedra trapped inside this Tower of Lies as well. I remembered Dramora. It wasn't the Daedra. They were Dramora, and that's what she was. I remembered. Right. right. Yeah, the Dramora are, the, I guess, the humanoid versions, because the Daedroth is that giant crocodile-looking thing. Yeah. And actually, I think Daedroth technically is the singular form of Daedra, but it became also known as that crocodile-looking thing. Anyway, semantics. Um... So we go through and we actually have to rescue all the different prisoners that are trapped in there and find the captains and everything like that. It's really fascinating because one of the things is the captains are at the top end. So we kill off the slave master and free off all the people down at the bottom and they start uh, the orc is like leading this little offensive to try to rescue their captain and their captains are at the kind of like a civil war because the one of them is cursed that she thinks everyone's out to get her. Do you remember that part? Oh yeah, yeah. And it, I enjoyed watching their interactions because I don't think it was so much that she was cursed, but she was kind of driven insane by being in this location because it was doing something to the to, to everyone who was there. And she thought that her best friend was actually the slave master and she keeps trying to kill her her companion because she thinks that he's after her and we're trying to talk to her and she's like no 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 that's that's just that's not gonna fly with me if you want me to believe you i need you to go like all the way over there somewhere and find me my helm because for some reason her helm is the only way for her to see the truth i don't know didn't quite get it so we had to go search for a helm. We brought it back to her, and she's like, "Oh, that's right. I remember who I am." And then, you know, I don't really remember how the quest ends. <laughs> that's where we make the deal with the other Dramora, where she says that the uh, the the leader of the Tower of Lies ha blocked off the only portal out of the area. So we actually have to hunt him down. We kill him, and then it it frees the the barrier to the portal. And we can all escape. So it, 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 that was a that was a pretty good quest. Now the the last section. Oh, did you have something else to say about? Uh, I was just gonna say that when you have to dive off the cliff into this pit, it actually made my stomach turn because it's so high, and I don't enjoy heights. Well, it makes it even worse because when your character jumps from such a high point, they actually scream as they're falling. Now, luckily, you fall in water. But it, it was just like my stomach was doing flips the entire way that my character was jumping into this water. <laughs> yeah, I do remember that. It was very far. Um, the next section we do is the last section that we found in the western third of Cold Harbor. And it was an area known as the Spurned Peak. Now, what was really funny is you find all these notes to start the quest, and he's a recurring character. Um, we find him again on the other side of the chasm as well. We're not going to talk about that this week. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Stibbins. Now, I've not ever encountered this Stibbins character in the Ebonheart Pact, but he follows one of the nobles in one of the other areas. I'm thinking Daggerfall Covenant. 
I don't know why he would be part of the Aldmar Dominion because he's clearly a Breton, but he is the manservant of one of these noble ladies, and he's just determined to get back to her. But what's really funny is as you're going through, he's writing all these notes going, this beautiful winged twilight has taken a liking to me and she keeps trying to seduce me. I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to withhold against her advances. And each time as you're moving closer to the tower, each piece of his journal you find, he's getting more and more frantic. Like she's no longer accepting my refusals and she's getting more and more forceful. (laughs) Um, So you may, you fight your way all the way to the top of this tower and kill this wing twilight who who was ki- captured this kind kind of I don't even know how you want to describe him he's a balding breton who's I I don't really find all that attractive at all in terms of bretons but he's she's like he was enamored with me and you're like you kill her he's like oh thank you for saving me from her and her advances it is a shame though cuz she wasn't actually mean to me all the time other than the unwanted sexual advances so it was a really funny quest so you actually get him all the way down to the one safe zone and he says don't worry i'll make my way for the hollowed city and and then as we find out later he never made it there he winds up somewhere else this guy is just always getting himself in trouble so like we won't go into detail now but when we see when when I see him again, I think to myself, "Do we have to save this guy again? Didn't he learn the last time?" Uh, ironically, he kind of fallen into the same trap before, so the same type of trap, which you'll hear about next week, because I think I don't I think we're gonna cut it right at the chasm because we haven't really advanced the rest of the way, so there's not enough to keep going. <coughs> Excuse me, everyone. Um, but it, it is a funny, so stay stay tuned to next week to find out where else we find him, Stibbins. And also, if anyone else, any of our listeners know where in the story you run across Stibbins from one of the other factions, because I'm sure he's a recurring character, even if he's a minor character or always standing by or always around one of the noble ladies i i don't know if it was like a high kins lady i really think it's daggerfall covenant but let us know because i kind of want to find him on my daggerfall covenant character just run up to him and be like you sir need to watch yourself <laughs> so now that finished the western third and now we started moving on to the eastern third of cold harbor and one of the saddest things i think we saw was right when you enter the eastern part there is a dead Khajiit female and a male Khajiit. I'm going to let Thais talk about this. She always does these best. So we come out of the city and we're, we're walking along the road and we see these two Khajiit just, just on the ground. One is laying on the ground and there's, there's this other guy on top of her. And I, I, I just immediately felt so bad for this Khajiit because him and his wife had gotten stuck in some cavern surrounded by Dramora and they did everything they could to fight their way out and they were able to get out but right at the threshold to the city his wife died from injuries now the fact that his wife died wasn't the saddest part it was that he just wanted to give up He's talking about how his, his wife is gone. What is he going to do? He's stuck in Cold Harbor. His children are going to grow up with no parents because he has no way to get back to her. The only thing he's going to do is he's going to sit there, continually mourn, and that's it. He's just going to give up. And it was just devastating. Like, they weren't even a quest. They were just there. And just listening to how sad he was over the loss of his mate, Oh, it just, it pulled my heartstrings and I just, I wanted to like snack on him and go, no, you, you, you can't give up. You have to keep going. She'd want you to keep going, especially for the poor little Khajiit children. And while they're not directly tied to a quest, when you talk to them, they highlighted the, the cave they escaped from, which was a public dungeon. And there is a quest because you find her, is it a journal or a locket or something like that? 
that you return to him and when you return it to him that's when he's like she wouldn't want me to give up i do have these little kajiti babies and he says something along the lines of i know i have to keep going i know i'm gonna get out of here i have to get back to my children because my children need me and it was just it was just so awesome. And, and, and I, in my head, I think he says something along the lines of, like, I will always, you know, cherish you, my love. And then he stands up and it's just like, oh, way to go, guy. Way to go. Indeed. There is a, like, there's just a lot of sad in this game. And it, it's, it's awesome. Now, I do have one note on here is it was a public dungeon. And I did actually mark it down because I thought it was really cool. If you paid attention, again, a lot of people don't play the way I do, or you do, but the way they tie lore together, there was a story that you can pick up about Haman Forgefire. I think it first talks about it in East March, and you find out about the story there, and you actually find out about the woman who was, she was a, she was a blacksmith. Haman Forgefire was the best blacksmith in all the land, and it just it made her so angry that she was not as famous as this guy. And she finally got so angry with him that she made a deal with Molag Ball himself, going, I don't care what you do, I'm going to kill him and sacrifice him to you as long as you make a deal that I will be more famous then Haman Forge Fire. Of course, Molag Ball said, absolutely, we can do that. So what did she do? She went up to Haman Forge Fire in his, in, his, in, his, uh, in his foundry and stabbed him through the chest with his own like blade that he was working on, this red-hot blade, and cursed him into oblivion. And um, when the author- uh, authorities caught her, she was sentenced to death and was executed. And in doing so, Molag Ball said, you know, she called out the Molag Ball going, hey, you said I would be more famous. You didn't say I'd be caught and executed. He's like, no, you are more famous. You are more famous because you are known as the murderer of Haman Forgefire. And now this is your reward. So for the briefest of moments, she was more famous than Haman Forgefire. I think the line in the book was, on this day, you are the most famous. And it's just it was just like, wow, don't ever make a deal with a Daedric Prince, because it never goes well. There's a lot of fine print. <laughs> so, but what's kind of neat is because I guess he was sacrificed, his entire, the vault of Haman Forgefire, like you find him in a, like, uh, what are they called? Draugr form like he is an undead inside of this area and this whole area was pulled into cold harbor because of the pact she made with with moleg ball so as soon as i saw that i'm like <gasps> and it's just interesting how a lot of people would probably play through this but wouldn't get the lore implement you know like how it tied together this this quest went all the way back to east march and happened in east march but most people wouldn't even realize it was there unless you stopped and read the books or listened to all the quests and listen to people talk and it's just really fascinating to hear this stuff when it comes in like it's just really cool so that's what i had marked on now we did notice i think we went to four other places before we finished the eastern half and rescued the guy that's for the main quest which we're not going to go into the main quest line. I'm trying to avoid that at all costs. But, of course, there was one guy you had to rescue at the east side and one side you had to rescue on the west side to kind of build your city together. He was the last guy we needed. But we came across a vile laboratory, which was a Dwemer city that was pulled into Cold Harbor. Because it just it looks like Moly Ball will just pull anything he can find from Nern into Cold Harbor. That's how badly he wants to claim it. And in the Vile Laboratory, we find a Dark Elf and a Khajiit who they performed a soul merge on. Which is kind of like the plane meld, but on a much smaller scale where they managed to merge two souls into one body. And the Daedra and stuff would just let them work and let them work. 
because they thought it was kind of interesting because I think, I don't even know if it's really talks about it, but I don't, I think it was, maybe it was an accident on their part that they got merged together because they were in this, because the whole technology that the Dwemer had for this plane meld is the same, like they, even the other Daedra are saying this was the process they were using for the plane meld because they discovered these Dwemer who found out how to merge things. So Molag Ball actually stole the technology needed for the plane meld from this Dwemer location. And it's kind of neat. But we have to go in there and we have to try to save, like, split their bodies because their bodies are dying because a, a one body cannot support two souls because they keep vying for control even unconsciously and it destroys the body. Now, of course, we make our way through. They are... When you go through this quest, they act that they can actively change or, or switch who is the soul you are speaking to so when you first talk to the guy it sounds like he's talking to himself because he's using we and then he's going well you shut up i'll tell them so this is what's going on and he just seems really crazy and, and and you know your character's like uh there's no one else here and it, it was just every other time you talk to him the other soul was the dominant one but he's still talking to the guy who's you know on the back burner and th th this quest you know like most quests that i happen to talk about made me really sad you're going through this quest and you're you're collecting the different components that you need because there's actually a way where you th that you can un meld these souls so you're collecting different components you're kind of guiding them through this place because they don't have all the resources within themselves to do it to themselves. So you're kind of, you're, you're the hand at work here. And when you get to the, to the end of the quest, like you're, you, you keep talking to these guys and they're, they're talking back and forth to each other and they really seem like they're connecting the more you spend on this quest. So finally, when you get to the last part of the room, you're given a choice and it's just it's always such a bad choice and you you talk to you talk to the dark elf and you ask him okay well why should i choose you because uh, well, i was going to and you ask him why should i choose you because when you unmeld souls only one soul could inhabit one body. And since there was only one body, one of them had to die. And you, you talk to the Dark Elf, and he's like, well, I can tell you right now why I'd be the best choice. I, I have a lot to offer to the Mages Guild. I have tons of knowledge on my particular brand of magic. I, I, just, I, I have so much I can bring. And then he goes, but you know, I honestly can't say to choose me because the soul that I am with is also a pure and wonderful soul and it was just amazing to hear this come out of a dark elf because they're usually rough and and grr and all that stuff so you make the choice and do you want me to say who we chose okay we chose the dark elf because his response was just and yeah, and, and instead of the Khajiit, because his response was just, you know, he was actually saying, don't pick me. But in saying that, it was like, okay, it's it's okay. And then after you separate them and the Khajiit dies, he starts saying a whole bunch of strange things. Like, you know, I, I actually miss him being there. He was He was always there. He had a lot of good ideas. He was a good person. And even when you see him later in town, he's still saying the same thing, saying, you know, he he really should be here for this for this meeting. He would have had a lot of input, and it's just it's so incredibly oh sad. <laughs> the choices you have to make. Oh, I'm gonna be sad over here. You go. It, it was sad because I like Zer, the Khajiit alchemist, and then there was the uh, dark elf um, mage. And even they said, like, you know, I've grown quite fond of him because we've had to share the space for so long. I can't tell you to pick me. It it was heart-wrenching. Like, we didn't. 
I, I liked the Khajiit and I liked him. I didn't know who I want, but you couldn't. You had to pick someone, or they both die. And that was a rough choice. It really was. Now we continued venturing further south, and we came across another location. Another location pulled directly in uh, due to a bad, 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 bad deal with a Daedric prince. It was called the Everfull Flagon. And it was kind of neat because when you walk in, it's all these Nords. Like, you find a note from a guy who's like, I can't stand here any longer. Something is wrong with this place. We have to escape. But the more we drink the ale, the more we have to drink more. And you go in to find that it was this one, the, the barkeep's daughter's husband who died. He just couldn't take it anymore. And they've been working on a way of freeing themselves from this daedric plot so as my phone goes off <laughs> ironically i'm playing elder scrolls that's my ringtone so it's okay um it, the thing is as you go through and you're trying to subvert the thane as they call him like you have to drink because the thane's important you have to drink um the thane is actually one of these dramora saying you must drink and you go to help out all the people of this of this town, and in doing so, you actually find out that the barkeep, the barkeep was the one who made the deal, and he was a good guy, but he made the deal with the Daedric Prince because he was he he wasn't selling enough meat. Like he's like, I opened up this thing, uh, this this tavern and now barely anyone walks into it you know and he was trying to be um trying to be a good guy like he always would help out anyone out in the community but his business was failing so he made a deal with the daedric prince now he like he said he's like i knew what i was doing but i didn't know it would affect everybody um he actually didn't know it was a daedric prince do you remember he thought it was just a mage that was going to help him improve his brew that's that's what it was and then he found out later that it was actually the prince in disguise who i just totally you know crapped all over him well even so but um yeah that is correct but i know he said i didn't still didn't think it would affect everyone it was my deal but it sucked him and his entire village into cold harbor and they were forced always to drink this ale so we did actually get a chance to free them like free their souls from this guy uh, the Dramora, and we actually led them back to the Hollowed City. And from the Hollowed City, we decided we're venturing north on the eastern third of Cold Harbor. For of what? Northern third. No, no, we didn't go to northern third yet because the northern third is the Chasm. No, we went north on the eastern third. So we went up there, and there was actually two other places that we found. Um, the first off, I'm going to talk about this one pretty quickly. Uh, the Court of Contempt, which was kind of cool. We found a guy outside who was actually in the shape of one of those little demon bankins. Because he was part of a group of mages who were set out to strengthen the Daedric portals. Because when you, when you first go into Cold Harbor, if you follow the story, part of Molag Ball's realm's defenses is they scattered all the people when they came in that was part of the defense so they sent these conjuration guys in that they were there to strengthen the portals um strengthen the different portals to allow easier for people to come into cold harbor without getting scattered to the far off realms of wherever they were because <clears throat> that's pretty much what you're doing in cold harbor is collecting the different parts of your expedition and regathering them back at the hollowed city and uh the neat thing is, like, when you go in, it's kind of because it was uh, Judge Zarin or something like that. He's like, yeah, no matter what, they say it's a, a court that will determine if they're guilty, but everyone's always guilty. So you have to go in there and you have to rescue them. You you stop the, the sentencing. You free the different slaves that are already been sentenced to death. And you actually get to escape into this arena and fight off all these different daedra. It was a fun quest, and you lead them back to the Hollow City as well. Now, the final section we went to in the Eastern Third was the Cliffs of Failure. Now, 
here here's something that's kind of interesting because the first time we found it we found it before we attempted the the court of contempt but cliffs of failure was bugged the quest this is where we found a, a quest bug that we couldn't uh we couldn't plant seeds because when you go in there dr the dramora are playing a game with the people they captured and actually what's really neat um in this game the odds are never in your favor <laughs> yes start or it's not start hunger games i was thinking of the parody there starving games which is awesome and funny but uh it's kind of neat because actually when you get to this cliffs of um, failure you're gonna notice something and the thing is each one of the people that in the contest are people you killed in the main storyline it is the main bad guy yeah they are the main bad guy because we had the uh the necromancer in the head of the worm cult who we killed on the very top of the mountain in east march the other two are the main bad guys that you kill in the final zones of the other two factions when you killed them because they made a dark plot with Molig ball now their souls are bound into cold harbor so each one of those people that we helped was the main bad guy in one of the other the the you know the culminating storyline for each of the final ones you can look it up i looked it up already because <laughs> i i'm sitting here looking at it going why is this worm father who was pretty much the main bad guy and part of the worm cult and the major moving force in the Evan Hart pack storyline? Why is he here? And then as I look at each one of them, they each, and then when the guy that we picked who I'm not going to give the name because it will be a spoiler for the end of the Daggerfall covenant point. Um, he said he made a pact with Molag ball to have this power to do whatever it was that he needed. And now he failed. So, here he is. And I'm sure the other lady, again, with her... <clears throat> I'm not going to say what they were, but her power and her little... Was apparently trying to overthrow the Aldmari Dominion and was defeated. And I, and I looked it up online because I had to. But, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see when we play through those. You'll actually see those characters again in, in, the bad, in their bad roles as you go along. But, yeah, they were... And they're playing a game where... If one of them, they are stuck forever playing this three-way war where they use pawns, like they can't indirect, they can't directly intervene with the game, but they have to capture other people. And in this case, it was three of our mages from the from the uh, mages guild that they use as pawns, and they have to give them power and stuff like that to defeat the other two. And if anyone wins, they'd be allowed to leave. But this one was bugged for us when we first went into it. And we're unable to actually do much. But we finally did unbug it. And you actually have to pick a side. You have to side yourself with one of the three bad guys. And they have to join. you have to join their side. And we actually picked the Daggerfall Covenant one. Because I hated Wormfather. And I didn't want to work with a, with a High Elf. So we picked the lesser of the two evils. And went with a Reachman. Um, and uh, as such... As we went through, we actually had to help him along and we, we free them. But at the end, he's like, okay, now you're free to go, but you have to make a choice. Since he, since the guy you helped did not actually win the game, you can choose either to take him and your mage friends constantly stay, or you can pick your mage friends and uh, we keep him. Thankfully, thanks to that trait, in intimidate we were able to intimidate him into saying that we would constantly disrupt his game for all eternity if we didn't give us both of them and he's like well the game must go on i can't have it interrupted so you could have them both and just be gone um <clears throat> molek ball will be upset at this but he'll be more upset with the game being interrupted constantly so you actually got to free both of them if you have the intimidate perk so that is pretty much the end of our tales for this week um, oh, but first, it's not quite the end of our tales. I almost forgot. Once you do that, we freed the other guy, um, the other main storyline guy. So that, that saved both the people we needed to and restored the city. So we went back and you had to go pay attention to the war council where they're saying, okay, we're going to launch an assault against Molek Ball. 
and we have to go into the northern third, which is called the Chaz, and we have to go across there. So that's where we're going to start up next week. But we found something kind of interesting when just exploring the city after it was restored. We went into uh, the alchemy research area, and we found a dark elf lady. Now, I'm going to talk about the dark elf for right now, uh, Thaisa. So we're going to have you take over the other part afterwards. But the Dark Elf, as you talk to her, of course, everyone in there has a little bit of a line. And her line was, you know, I, I don't know how I can concentrate under all this. And you're like, well, what's wrong? And she's like, there's this Khajiit. She she left a, uh, a, a dead skeever on my front porch. And you're like, what? She's like, yeah, that's not even the worst of it. Then she's over here rubbing up against me. And then she came up and bumped her forehead against mine like i don't know what's going on it's driving me nuts and one of the options you could say was well maybe she likes you and dark elf goes what no oh no that well oh, well you know okay well she is kind of cute i mean she's kind of like a big kitten maybe i should just have her over for dinner and thais was just enamored by this lady so i continued to search again i actually found the khajiit in the main uh the main thoroughfare for where all the merchants were and as soon as i found her i had to call her over and says, oh, look who i found look who i found <clears throat> so you get to talk to this because and we'll, we'll let these tell you what she says because she actually's been practicing this all right so when you talk to her you're given a few options about about this this dark elf and and i really wanted to say it out loud because i've been practicing my khajiit voice when you ask her about it she goes Oh, this one cannot stop thinking about the dark elf enchanter with the fragrant odor. The world is coming to an end. What does it matter if Erki want to run the claws through enchanter's luxurious locks of hair? And then your character's option is to say, well, does she know that you like her? And her response is, how could she not? Didn't Erki follow all of the appropriate courting steps? This one rubbed against the dark elf's shapely leg. This one performed the bump of the forehead. Erki even left a dead skeever to show how much she cares. And I, I was dying the entire time reading this. I, I had to read it and listen over and over. <laughs> It, it was quite funny when I saw that because it just made me think of my my little Khajiit here sitting on my desk. I performed the bump of the forehead. It, it just it cracked me up. I even left a skeever on her on her porch for good measure. And I'm like, well, my cat's done that with mouse. It, it, it's just funny to see the Khajiit act like cats. And actually, also one other funny thing I actually saw was a screenshot of the Khajiit. In their in their starting zone, I think it's uh, Karuthi's roost. Um, there's this Khajiit. She's all freaked out, going, "What is that terrible monster over there?" And you look over in the cage, and they caged a puppy. Like it's a little puppy in this cage. She's like, "Oh, look how horrid it is!" And it's just this little puppy going. Bark. <laughs> it's just yeah, cats and dogs. It cracks me up. So that ends our tales for the, this week. And next week, you'll get to hear us as we venture north into the northern third and cross the chasm and get closer to Molag Ball. So, moving on to the next section, which is our dramatic reading. And this week, it is the sixth part of our eight-part series, and the book is The Totems of Hercene. Thais, take it away. Among those of us to whom Lord Hercene bestowed this most precious gift of lycanthropy, there are legends that he also set into the world specific artifacts of his power. They date to a period when men could neither write, nor speak, nor barely think, but the powers of blood of the beast were yet flowing strong among the selected. The first, a carved skull of the wolf itself, used by those ancient shamans in the blood ceremonies that created our lineage, it is said to grant a great presence to those who prostrate themselves before it such that those who witness their forms cower in a terror unknown except to those who have glimpsed the fate of Hercene himself. The second, a thigh bone, carved as the skull, but from some unknown animal. 
used as some form of medicinal wand in the more ancient brotherhood, it was said to grant a kind of heightened awareness, both in sight and smell, such that the prey could neither flee too far from our senses. The third, a simple drum, its mundane appearance meaning it is most likely lost to the mists of long ago. As our fathers would beat time to summon their brethren from the fields, so too would our forebears in the blood call their allies to them with its pounding. Through these totems, we channel and focus our energies of the beast. While werewolves give up the powers of magic known to men, we can tap into a more direct natural energy at times, and through these totems, discover the abilities that first tamed the world before wrought civilization sullied it. I really like the werewolves. I really do. I think they are the cooler of the two uh, ones available in in Elder Scrolls lore. I don't really care for the vampires that much. So, I don't know. So, that was awesome. We're going to move on to our next section, the community spotlight. Now, this week, um, the community spotlight I'm doing is actually... An expiring offer, so you should really head over there. And uh, as of the posting of this episode, which will be Monday, June six, you only have Monday and Tuesday to do this. Tamriel Foundry is doing an ESO poster giveaway. Uh, you can win a copy of the ESO poster collection, which features forty pieces of the official concept art and illustrations. You only have until Tuesday, June 10th to enter. So as of listening to this episode on Monday, uh, you'll have to either do it that day or early on Tuesday to be qualified. So definitely head on over to Tamriel Foundry and enter if you're interested in uh, getting the ESO poster uh, book, which is pretty cool because we talked about it, I think, last episode because it was officially released. Some pretty nice stuff in there. So definitely go... Apply. It's super simple. You go onto their site, and actually, all you have to do is comment on the article telling telling the poster Atropos what was your favorite concept art loading screen in the game. So that it, it's pretty simple to apply, and he'll randomly pick somebody, and that person will be will get this. So, and it's only available to U.S. players. Sorry. Only available to U.S. They're they're not doing EU or Oceanic. So uh, if you're in the U.S. and are interested, go and apply. Worst case scenario, you don't win. Awesome. Okay, moving on to the next spot, the Guild update. As always, Guild is moving forward. Um, If you're interested in joining our, our friends and family guild for the fans of Tales of Tamriel, you can whisper or send an in game mail to at Agelos. A G G E L O S or at Tear Eater T E A R E A T E R for an invite to the guild. Also, for those who want to PvP with us in Cyrodiil, we are representing the Ebonheart Pact on the Hope's Fire campaign. Um, I don't have any plans on moving from Hope's Fire, even though as of now it seems like it's kind of whatever. But I don't, I don't really think I want to move to the two-week campaign. I think I'm going to wait a little longer to see what they do. But that may change in the future. Because as of now, the Aldmari Dominion have, have had Emperorship for about a month. So it looks like no one's really even entering Cyrodiil anymore on our side. So that might be up for a little bit of debate, but we'll go forward from there. All right, so now it's time to give away our Imperial Edition of the Elder Scrolls Online that was generously donated to us from a listener in Gildy Arc. Um We've randomly selected one winner from the comments that were posted on our official site, uh, talesoftamriel.com. I really wish I could give more away to all those great people, but sadly we only have one copy to give away. Um, so what I did was I took all of the all the eligible names that were posted on there that said they wanted it, put it into uh, my random, random site generator, uh, and it randomly picked us a name. And so without further ado... And I just noticed I spelled a do wrong on my show notes, but that's okay. It's a French word. We have randomly selected the hollow. So hollow, congratulations. Um, we're going to actually email the registered email account of the, of the poster. 
So please respond back to our email. That way we know that you actually got the email because I know some people actually uh, use throwaway emails to sign up. Um, if, if you don't respond by next Sunday, we will pick another person off the list and try emailing them until we get someone to award the prize to. So thank you so much to all those who entered and a special thanks again to ARC for generously donating this uh, to our show. And Hala, you'll have to you'll have to message Ark and, and thank him as well. <laughs> so awesome! Thanks to everyone who uh, who um, applied to win. Okay, moving on to the next section, which is the emails. Uh, we had no iTunes reviews this week, but we did have one email. And Thais, why don't you go ahead and read that? First of all, thank you, Ajelos and Thais, for the awesome work that you both have been doing. Thais, please forgive any grammar error that I may incur. I am not a native English speaker. I would like to suggest an easy and fast guild event, which I believe would help a lot of people. There are some public dungeon group challenges spread around the world, which provide a skill point if completed. I believe there are around four, maybe five for Evanheart Pact, Blood for the Pact, which means four to five additional skill points. I completed them with another guild. It literally took me 30 minutes tops, but the benefits will be there forever. Just to put in perspective, think about the guilt that we felt for helping Shea Gorath for just two skill points. Now we can have the double amount, no guilt, and a lot of happy guildmates. By the way, Thais could use them for her dagger project, while you, Ajelos, could use them in bow or dual wield. Another suggestion would be Sky Shards and Cyrodiil. This one can easily end up in a very fun, massive confrontation. I particularly like the Tales section, when you guys tell us about your adventures in the game. I'm a little bit ahead, so for me, is not a spoiler, but a recollection of, about those events. It allows me to compare my choices with yours and see if I have a Berserker Nord or an emotional Argonian within me. Thank you both for taking the time and doing this great podcast. It is always exciting when a new episode becomes available every Monday morning. Stay moist from Beryl. Awesome, awesome. Uh, uh, thank you so much for those emails. I love getting those um in game they're they're just fantastic all right so now it's that time of the show for our final thoughts so hey tell us your final thoughts for this episode i can't wait for armor dies oh i can't wait i also can't wait to finish cold harbor and the show was amazing as usual very happy and you know just to let anyone know if you want to contact me in game you can contact me at tear eater t-e-a-r-e-a-t-e-r you can also send all hate mail to tear eater because it's her no okay she's giving me eye daggers over here but that's okay um it definitely was a fun show i'm glad we got to give away the the imperial edition going to a good home and uh i'm excited that that we got to do that um, I'm really, really thankful to our, our donator and, and we'll just say pretty much the, uh, what was the word here? This show brought to you by Eric who donated to us today. That was awesome. Thank you so much again. And I love doing this show. Fantastic. Um, I'm excited for armor dies as well. Maybe not quite as excited for you. Cause I'm, I, I like these little, uh, um, quality of life. That's the word I was looking for, a phrase. Quality of life changes. I like them. I think they're great. Um, I'm still looking for a little bit more substantial things, such as housing and better raids. Um, but that that's still to come. So I'm still excited to see what they can do. And they're definitely they're definitely doing a good job so far. So we'll see what they're what they come up with. So I want to thank my co-hosts for joining me this evening. Um, thank you for everyone who listened to the podcast. If you wish to help support the podcast, feel free to donate via our PayPal link on our website. If you wish to contact us with questions, comments, criticisms, the website for our show is talesoftamriel.com, or you can email the show at podcast at talesoftamriel.com. You can follow the show on Twitter at Tales of Tamriel, Facebook at facebook.com slash tales of Tamriel podcast are on YouTube at youtube.com slash tales of Tamriel. I do put all of our episodes up there, even though we have audio episodes, I just put an image. And so people who like to listen to YouTube only can also get to us. Um, 
Also, feel free to rate and subscribe to us via iTunes. The the ratings definitely help us out a lot, guys, and we do appreciate them. Thank you so much for listening, and we hope you enjoyed this episode of Tales of Tamriel. Have a great evening. Bye.